So <laughs> my screen is visible. Okay, so fine then we will <clears throat> just let me cover a few more things which I left in the previous session and I will come to a few other topics too for uh, your information. So let me keep it light without any much on the math details. So then uh, after that we will conclude all the sessions and go for uh, your test and uh, well directory. So we cannot affish, I mean, uh, uh, this is not in a physical mode, but just I will make some concluding remarks and we will continue after that. Okay, so let me just uh, start from the point where we have been discussing. And one thing, uh, uh, I have to also update these slides, but I have to make one correction what uh, one of the participants, I think, uh, someone pointed out that the generation is 2.5 and 2.7. I have to correct that. So once I corrected that, I will upload these slides to the portal. So. These accounts will be active until end of this week. So before that, whatever the sessions or recordings, whatever you want to download, download it before that. Anyway, since there are only less participants, I will announce that again um, during the conclusion time. Okay, so let me start uh, the presentation where we have been. So, okay, so <clears throat> we have seen that how the general training signal or synchronization problem can be casted in the CS framework. So uh, I think I have given you enough, but this is very rough picture that um, about the training signals and the type of the training signals. But in LTE, I think you have a very detailed picture of that. Just I have kept it for convenience to show you how the other things happen. For example, in LTE, every frame is made up of uh, 10 millisecond duration. So every five millisecond, there is a synchronization signal is transmitted. One at the preamble, at the beginning of the frame. Another is at the mid-amble, at the middle of the frame. So arbitrarily, when, so it keeps on transmitting in this 10 millisecond frame window. So when you suddenly switch on your mobile or when you lost your connection and you begin you switch it on or uh, look for the new towers around you, you may start anywhere from here. So at that time, just from the start of the time, you will keep on scanning for the training signal. You will have a local copy of that. So again, as I said, there are LT504 signals. But out of the 504, there are so known as primary PSS, primary synchronization signals and secondary synchronization signals. And uh, I have not gone into these details, but uh, this 504 is divided into three groups and each group has a common PSS, but different SSS like that. So finally, you have the concatenated PSS and SSS sequences. By identifying the location of the uh, proper training sequence, you will be able to find out whether that is a preamble or mid-amble or where you are, whether you are at the beginning of the frame or at the end of the frame. Okay, sorry. So now, when you have multiple antennas at the receiver, so you will be, you can also make your receiver such a way that you can receive the synchronization signal from the different antennas. So what will happen? I have just drawn the picture in an ideal case, but there may be slight uh, offset between when you take the antenna signal to inside, there will be a slight offset. But essentially what will happen? You, from the multiple copies of the same signal with the different antennas, you will come to know that Okay, we have different observation signals, but the training signal location is same relatively in all of these frames. So that would help you to frame your problem as a multiple measurement vector problem. So what we have seen. So the same formulation, whatever I have mentioned, is still valid. We have to go through the same procedure. But apart from that, what will happen? This problem will be coming into the GMMB model, where you have multiple observations and you have a joint blocks for signal. The join blocks per signal is nothing but a set of blocks per signals that have the same sparsity pattern. So the location of the non-zero entries are same in all of these frames. So when you have multiple antennas and multiple receiver copies, you can cast the problem as a GMMB problem. Right? And apart from that, one other technique what you could have seen in that table once I share is the non-orthogonal multiplexes. The, when you say orthogonal multiplexes, meaning that those two resources do not interfere with each other, that's it. To 
for example when you say two signals are orthogonal in time that means that the x1 t x2 t do not interfere with each other right they are not necessarily be the signals which are like for example at different time instant also not interfering with each other and even at the same time also we can make two time domain signal orthogonal to each other by means of changing the shape of the signal so if you have two signals f1 and f2 with the proper separation then you can make them orthogonal so like that when there are two signal two resources in any aspect either time or frequency or space they are said to be orthogonal to each other if they do not interfere with each other or they don't have any common uh, parameters to it but what kind of uh, multiplexes we have nearly reset in 1g we have the frequency division multiplexes in the sense that every user will be given different frequency slot in the available bandwidth they can communicate in that and in the 2g is a time division multiplexes where it will be like a round of switches switch will keep on getting the signal from each of you and keep it in a frame as a time so one frame is divided into multiple time slot every time slot is given to a particular user so every time when the clock ticks for the particular slot user has to put the data in that so that is tdma and in the case of cdma which is referred to as co division multiplexes in the co division multiplexes what we have is that we are giving different codes to every user and we we make uh, these codes such a way that you are able to separate their signal such a receiver side or transmitter side okay and now in the 4g we are looking for uh, uh, orthogonal frequency division multiplexes of dma the difference between of dm of dma is nothing technically both are same they employ the sub carriers they use everything of dma is a physical layer technique of dma is something referred to the mac layer in the sense that the same sub carriers the time uh, different time slot how do we assign to different users that is what of dma but again that is applying that is applying the of dm so of dm of dm are not different when you view the of dm uh, part in the, uh, from the physical layer perspective that's a technique of modulation when you think of the same how do you assign the sub carriers to different users how you can make the resource allocation problem that comes to of dm and now what we have what happens in the future we are trying for something known as non orthogonal multiplexes this norma is not something like a far away or something completely new this has been in tradition in the name of uh, successive interference cancellation so what is like uh, the same thing uh, for a particular say i take a same uh, frequency band i encode both of two user signal in the same frequency band so one has to direct the signal and it has to cancel if it is not uh, In, intended to the particular user then decode successively so what will happen is it will uh, when you merge them there is a different power allocation to the users so every user will detect the strongest signal first estimate the component cancel it from the observation and do the successively like that until that gets its own signal in its hand so that is what we refer to as uh, sic the same sic platform is in a different flavor or something in uh, like uh, Uh, gold wine in the new bottle that's it noma is not far away from the sic thing that is the same thing which has been invented and in practice for a longer time now they are trying to implement noma in a different perspectives like um, in a sense we yeah. have a question from rajan yeah ah yes uh, please go ahead Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, sir. Uh, sir, could you could you please is, uh, explain once more this NOMA concept? Because as uh, just as you told that uh, the, the same frequency will be allocated to all, I mean, means two or three users, but with different power. So how we actually map uh, the different user data over a same channel uh, with different power means? What is what is the technique behind? Okay, so let me check if I have proper figure for that. No, this is. so imagine that uh, actually this figure is not for that but let us just take it for convenience and uh, say this is user one data this color is user two data this is user three data okay now what i am going to do i am going to transmit in the same time same frequency band to three of you so all of you will receive the signal what i am going to transmit how i will do that i will multiply this first green component with say 0.8 Say one for example, then multiply this with zero point five, multiply this with zero point two, 
and then sum it up and transmit to you. Now what will happen? Assume that I'm not going to the channel again. In that don't make it uh, don't make it too complicated. It's a simple understanding. So what we will do? Say this uh, user one signal, user A, user B, user C. Now three of you will receive the same signal, which is nothing but superposition version of the same say, all of your data. So first say you are user one. Okay. Now this is what your signal. You will simply first estimate since that is the strongest one. You just take it, decode, and take it. Out. User two, which is but the next a, one. Over over a same frequency, uh, how yeah. could means uh, uh, we ensure at the receiver that uh, we will get the three uh, amplitude of uh, different uh, value of the signal? Yeah, that is the and that is the Maybe maybe it's some uh, due to some at, uh, attenuation and or uh, fading, uh, the amplitude may vary, and so maybe that there is a chance that uh, although the frequency is same, by and if the amplitude also get changed, then how could we receive uh, uh, means no, no. Uh, extract back receive the signal back? Yeah, that is what I said. I have looked at the channel gain part uh, uh, not covered here. Okay, that is depending on both the channel gain. Okay. Since you have gone to the channel part, I have to explain more. Suppose you have two users, just to say for example, okay, you have to allocate okay. power to both of them. One is the very strong user, okay, when is a very weak mm -hmm. user. In the strong mm -hmm. user, okay, since he has a very, very mm -hmm. good channel condition, you can invest all of your power there so that the overall sum rate will be maximized. One thing. Again, okay, this is what known as water filling algorithm. So water filling will try to ensure that. All the data, whatever you are giving, gives your most invest, your most of your energy in the channel where it has a very good condition, so that you can increase your system throughput. Second is that suppose you have one strong user, one you have a weak user. There is something known as fairness to all the users. So what actually I have to do? I have to give more power to the one to the weaker user, so that he can get at least the minimum data rate which is guaranteed. With these two perspective, what we are doing based on the effective channel and the transmitted power. The gain I am saying one in the multiplied by user one point nine is including both the transmitted power and the channel gain. Okay, so now you so have how many different level uh, over a over a channel means for example if I am having a channel uh, with some uh, frequency. So how yeah. many such uh, levels we can create or how many such levels we can pre-assume to allocate uh, the different. Uh, 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 voltage levels to the different oh, users. Yeah. Is there you any are uh, control or what is, you are asking? What is the relative levels I am talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, that is the result of an optimization program. If you write the sum rate in optimization program, log two of one plus SNR and another user's data, treating the other interference into account. So that optimization function will tell you how much power you have to invest to, to maximize the system throughput for the given condition. See, there is a limitation for anything. We given the channel, that is what you can achieve. We cannot go beyond that. But what is the best you can achieve? That optimization program will give you that. But in the user side, what always the thumb rule is that detect the strongest user signal first. Since that is very stronger, you will be able to detect that easily, treating other signal as interference. Once you know that signal, remove the component if minus. You, if, 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 if we follow the thumb rule, then we can say only the strongest and weakest means uh, over a same frequency, we can maximum two, um, uh, minimum, sorry, minimum two uh, users we can communicate. Meaning no, means no. we make a channel for two users only. Actually, you are correct. Very well said. See, actually, SIC works better when you have two users. When you increase the number of users, SIC is very prone to more error. But that will work very well with two users. But if you increase the number of users, that performance will come down. Oh. When you have two extreme cases, like very strong, very weak, that will work very well. Because say this is one, this is hundred, this is one, for example. Then hundred you can detect easily, treating that one as an interference. You will get very good performance, decode the data. Then once you know what is the data, you can cancel that from your observation. You minus that. Then remaining is nothing but your two data, right? So use A plus B plus some noise to detect A because A is very well visible to you. Then remove A, you will come to know what is B. And but further, now, it will be depend upon the sensitivity of uh, the receiver, right? Yes, yes, yes. Right. Actually, which two users I have to combine, how to give and power. Everything is an optimization solution. You cannot straight away say, this is a rule, go ahead with that. 
so for oh, the, for you, the given yeah for the given channel conditions you have to apply the programming and then you can allocate the power and group the user so that's a different problem what is the user grouping what is a power level yeah yeah yeah, yeah. But as you said, when you have more number of users with a step by step like that, it will create more errors. So far, uh, when you have two SIC with two users, works very well. And also, don't confuse that with the, since I am transmitting both user one data to user two data on the same channel. So uh, both of us getting others data also. What about the privacy and secrecy? Don't worry. Don't think in that aspect. Yeah, yeah. That data. That data is a final raw form after encryption and everything. Okay, yeah, all that thing level. at physical level it will be something. Yes, like exactly. It. Because everything is done at the higher layers. Now also you can receive your signal. When you are talking over the phone, I am uh, standing next to yeah. you. I can receive your signal, but no intelligence. My receiver cannot. Do that effect we that effect we will get in terms of wave voltage variation or some that yeah. is another thing. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So I hope no other questions. Yeah. Okay, so let me go to the past. So that is what this NOMA is all about. Like, uh, so we are combining the different uh, resources and do the SIC, successive interference cancellation of the receiver and get on there. Now there is something like a sparse code NOMA, in the code domain NOMA. So what they do, like suppose if you have six users, you take only four resources and group them in a such a way that once they combine and have an effective code book, I have not the details of this map, but just you can check. Essentially, what is it all about is you have four resources. So ideally, you are able to serve only four users. One resource need one user. But you can obtain six users by properly giving them in a... There are four C2 combinations are here. So if, if you are properly put your data in this part, wherever by separating them nicely and apply some known as factor graph method, what you have seen yesterday or message passing algorithm, you will be able to decode the information. So now the other variant of NOMA, like code domain NOMA, whatever we have, I said this, nothing but power domain NOMA. But there are like a code domain NOMA, so which is what SEMA, so that sparse code multiple access technique. Now this is also one of the uh, recent techniques you can refer to the paper, what I have given in here. So uh, that has a very good um, uh, scope, if at all you have to do something and try, if you are doing this as in this relevant area. Okay, so now to so see these things, uh, one thing about I want to tell you about the beam forming because I need that in the subsequent slides as well. So in the beam forming is nothing as I have already shown you. In the spatially, you adjust the complex or uh, complex value. We are saying that because uh, the phase shift is represented as a complex shift in the uh, frequency domain. When you say X of T signal, the X of T minus tau, the delay in the time, we have to see the time delay in the frequency spectrum. But frequency, you are not supposed to again talk about the time delay. So that is why we say that is as a phase shift. That phase shift is nothing but e power j2 pi f tau into again x of f. So that is what the Fourier transform was. So when you have the Fourier transformation, so what you see in the time, that is re reflected as a phase shift in the corresponding uh, spectrum of that. So now, what we are trying to do is that with the different antennas, we are adjusting the time delay between the signals so that they properly combine in a particular direction only, not in all the directions. So that is what the beamforming technique. That is what we say in this kind of, with the technical term in the frequency spec, uh, domain is that the complex phase shift test will uh, adjust the complex gain of the uh, signal so that in the particular channel when it is traversing through, that is getting maximum only in a predefined direction. That is what beamform. So like that, for example, if you have, I will show you another figure. So there are multiple antennas at the transmitter and receiver. So now you have a channel. Somehow you can make the signals phase shift in such a way that you can uh, tra transmit through a particular direction and receiver also can look at a particular direction. So that is what transmit beamforming, receiver beamform. That can be done in two ways, three ways actually. One is that fully analog beamforming. I will show you the figure, not these equations. Okay. Now, whenever you want to transmit a particular symbol or complex, okay, you need one RFC. So you have the baseband model, which is doing the baseband modulation, everything, and DAC digital to analog converter. And actually, I have 
I just skipped many parameters like power amplifier and the low noise amplifier, uh, band pass filter and everything. So that is a series of hardware elements that comes to finally the RF front end. After this RF chain sequence of RF elements, it is coming to the front end. Now, the same signal is fed to, through all the antennas with the phase shifter. Okay, the phase shifter we understand in the frequency domain. Actually, that is nothing but a small delay element. So what will happen? This will transmit here. This will transmit slightly some few micros, microsecond is too large. Maybe half of that, some, uh, say a very tiny amount of time delayed by that and so on. So when you slightly adjust the time delay or in the spectra, when you adjust the corresponding phase of the signal, the phases are in such a way that they are transmitted only through a particular direction. If you are standing here, you will get null signal. But if you go here, you will get maximum signal. So the essential that will create a beam with very tiny side lobes. And the main lobe of the beam, where it is focusing or where it is directed to, will get the maximum signal. So that is what analog beam forming. Why is say analog? I am doing this beam forming only with the phase shifter. Phase shifter is nothing but just one element which adjusts in the time delay. That's it. I'm not doing any other processing. So that is what analog beam forming. So this is what the picture, how it is done. So you have all the antenna elements. Either this is either on the transmitter side or receiver side. The picture is applicable. Once you transmit all the signal towards a particular side, this signal will coherently construct in a particular direction and destructively add in another direction. So that is what this loop tends to. By properly choosing the value of the, uh, this del phi and what you have to adjust the amount of theta, how much you have to adjust it, you can scan the beam towards the entire direction. Okay, so this is what the analog beam forming and the digital beam forming. See the picture. Every antenna is connected to one RF chain. Okay, so this is the digital case where you just multiply the effective channel. I will show you the math for that in the next uh, slide or maybe in another, another slide. You have the transmitted signal S1 to SENT. Multiply that with the precoder. That is what digital beam form. Multiply that with the precoding matrix. The precoder will do in such a way that in the particular direction only that is getting the maximum. That is called a digital beam form. Where in the digital beam forming you need R of chain to every antenna element. Keep that in mind. In analog beam forming you have only, only one R of chain and it is done through the phase shifters. In the digital beam forming, all the antennas are connected to every RFC. It is done with the, in terms of pre-coded. Pre-coded digital beam forming are same, more or less, not much different. It's a different, it is named in a different context. That's it. Now, as I have already told you, we cannot have, uh, suppose if we have 1000 antennas at the base station or uh, say 64 antennas at the receiver target, you cannot have RF chain to each and every transmitting element which makes your energy more energy consumption more and you will be in a very uh, consuming more power in the transmitter and as well as the receiver side. To avoid that, what is something known as hybrid beam forming, combination of both analog and digital beam forming. What you do here, you instead of thousand, suppose you have thousand and as you don't have thousand RF chains, say you have only hundred RF chains. There are two kinds of structures. There are only 100 RF chains. Every RF chain is connected to all the antennas. That is fully connected hybrid beam former. If you group the antennas to a particular RF chain, that is partially connected beam former. But in any case, you have less than, far few lesser number of RF chains compared to the total number of transmit antennas. You connect them. Now this will do partially the digital precoder part and this will do the RF precoder part or analog beam forming part. By combining these two, you can, but of course, the best performance will be achieved by the fully digital precoder. Next one, you can come as close to that by properly doing the signal processing, the hybrid beam format. Analog phase, phase shifter is uh, with the analog beam forming with the phase uh, shifter is like a very crude way of doing the beam forming, just as a very simplest of form. Right. Now, in the hybrid beam forming case, you have lesser number of RF chains to save the energy and uh, uh, space consumption. But all these RF chains are connected to all the antennas or subset of antennas, depending on fully connected or subconnected architecture. Okay. I just skip this math. So, whomsoever in that area, you can understand. Now, where this uh, application of cloud computing, so this is one of the other area in, in the device setting, if you have seen. The cloud radio access network is, I will show the figure for better understanding. Now, there are many users and all these users are connected to the nearby tower, right? Now we have many such towers. 
Now, at present, what happens? Every base station is doing the computation. So the tower, what you have, you can see a big box uh, below the tower. It is doing all the computational part, right? But in the future, what we think about is that we just make this tower simply as the radio unit. Okay, they, they don't do any computation part. All the baseband computations will be done at the baseband processing unit, BBU pool. Here you have the kind of a supercomputers in the cloud. So very high, high fidelity processing processor and computers, what we call in the cloud, in the supercomputers will be here in this cluster. All these towers will be connected to this with the backbone network. Now what will happen? All this data will be connected and just passed through the cloud. Everything is done only by here. And different BBU pool will be connected to the central servers or MME, what we call mobility management entity. That is to know if you are moving from one tower to another or handover like that. And again, you have the gateway connected to the internet. And we have the front hall link and the back hall link. What we have and the remote radio head. This is instead of the tower, or technically we call E node B in the LT context. Now we call just that as a remote radio head. It's a radio head. It will receive and transmit like an antenna. That's all. All the processing will be done in the BBU. This is what the cloud run architecture proposed. But one of the challenge in the bottleneck is that suppose when you do all the processing here, we need the high end data, um, high processing speed here at the pool. And also that it has to switch over to multiple channels and transmit to them. And this data link, uh, friend call link also needs more attention because Suddenly, if the traffic load increases in a particular tower, how it has to go into manage? Suppose a particular tower needs more higher priority how to communicate. So these things are under research now. But this cloud run architecture is also one of the uh, more interesting and uh, active part where the research is going. Okay, I think this is a part which I wanted to tell you a few more things from the previous case. Now, uh, let me just discuss a few other things. But before I go, do you have any other questions? Your slides are okay. not visual, sir. No, no. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm switching to other slide. Just to know. Yeah, uh, sir. Uh, um, yeah. My few questions are, uh, means, uh, uh, is uh, one thing which is uh, related to, to to the performance parameter. Yeah, means yeah. Uh, just as uh, up to uh, 4G and all, we were talking about the outage probability and some symbol error rate. These are the performance parameter. So uh, uh, in in Noma and the upcoming modulation or in the beam forming sectors also, what will be the performance measures? Means are they the, the same means uh, symbol error rate or be, these will be the parameter or some other parameters uh, we can have to be analyzed for, uh, you know, perform as a performance measure? Yeah, okay. So essentially these kind of the common parameters, what we measure in terms of error rate or capacity, so that will be there. That will be uniform across for any user. That is what our final demand, our end user experience. But when you think of these kind of particular techniques, uh, for example, if you do the beam forming, I propose some beam forming technique, you are proposing another. How to compare these two? Two things is that how far effective your beam is, meaning that how you can make your beam width narrow so that interbeam interference can be avoided. Second, how much you are going to create multiple beams with a given number of antennas, something known as multi-beam technique. And another thing is that once you created the beam, once you locked with them, how, what is the probability that your beam slips with each other? So essentially, you have to think about the direction slightly slips over because of the channel conditions change. You, you might have heard about something like a channel coherence time. So everywhere yes. the channel remains static for a particular time, then it will change. Actually, it is persistent. Yes. So 
okay but um, when the channel slowly changes it is not abruptly changing from one matrix to another matrix right so from yeah, channel yeah. h1 to h1 that gradually moving and completely change into h2 so how mm-hmm. much the assumption there but you are assuming that channel remains constant over the duration so, so that that's the question no? means actually uh, i i am saying that because the channel parameters uh, when it will be changed how rapidly it will be changed it's entirely unpredictable so to estimate the channel uh, uh, we, we have to uh, look forward some uh, you know some parameters okay and uh, because uh, ultimately we required some mathematical expressions to model uh, this uh, this fading this uh, changing phenomena and we do not have get the exactly mathematical expression if we want to convert it back so uh, means uh, b- besides these parameters could we have some other uh, you know uh, ma- major measurement or some uh, indirect or indirect uh, uh, you know uh, mapping we can made so that uh, we can we further it will conclude with the ser or outage pro- outage error probability okay so if you get st- i mean uh, i don't know whether you have a particular problem where you cannot uh, track it or i don't know but in general the simple error rate probability and all you can derive only for the nice channel models see how the probability models we study with gauss and trolle and all that yeah. helps us to nice, nicely obtain a closed form solution like a q function or markham q function because we have taken mm-hmm. them nicely but all the time you cannot come and obtain a closed form solution so there are always we look at the bound so we keep the upper bound for that model and then we work on it so always we target to what is the worst case scenario that can happen in the channel condition we will be prepared for that so that is what actually in practice happens unlike we derive in our papers that you cannot always have a nice expression like okay 1 by e power x like that you cannot have a fine solution i think most of the time what we have see, uh, studied in the pre uh, papers which we have uh, which communicated in this field regarding the performance uh, 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 evaluations and all they uh, try to you know uh, make the pdf expression of uh, this uh, yeah. chan- uh, channel and yeah. uh, then uh, then he is trying to calculate on the basis of that he is trying to uh, calculate the performance parameter my question is simple that because this these pdfs are uh, which we are taken into consideration are uh, very well uh, means uh, uh, mathematically uh, mentioned but the actual uh, field data is uh, something different okay actually ranjan one thing you have, we have to uh, just re- see that uh, whatever we do math actually that the, that doesn't directly go to in practice or that is of no use to the industry straight away as a paper so we have done even enough paper work there are so many journals are working and so on right but say we propose an algorithm you might have seen in many papers like okay you do that for example take the noma case what we have pointed out so every time i have to check the channel condition it will vary so i have to keep on doing the optimization algorithm in the cvx2 but in the run time do you think all these things are possible with millisecond uh, computation complexity no, even no, whatever the method whatever the algorithm we do generally in yeah. a commercial perspective or which are really patented if you check them they are not like mathematically very intensive or something they are not like robust and blind methods you, how many times you keep on estimating the channel with the pilots and doing that channel keeps very fast if you are moving in a car car your channel changes within seconds yes so but these things are only on the paper on the research but why we have to do all the math is that that will give you the first some kind of an idea of in which direction you can think about all this math all these models are like if at all you have to approach something okay there are two things one we have the theoretical research on this area and one is a practical aspect in theory you can see n number of things you can derive the equations and so on right so that validating the mathematical consistency of the work but when you come in practice all the thing whatever you have proved and whichever is published that cannot be taken for the practical perspective directly without any modification that is why industry have their own r and d they will think about whether your paper, your paper your work is applicable in practice or not in when you are reviewing a paper what you are checking we are checking the derivation we are checking the closed loop form yeah you are done your paper is accepted but if you say ml mm-hmm. reduction you are you you are you are absolutely correct saying sir Uh, because yesterday we lot of uh, distributions we were discussing means like nakagami kappa mu and all 
but ultimately when we uh, simulate these uh, distributions over through the matlab and all so finally we come back to the basic relay channels only means all yeah. the conditions yeah, because we direct we directly we cannot able to exactly simulate some uh, specific value which we uh, choose for uh, we have to consider all the uh, all the uh, restrictions conditions and come back to the relay only then yeah. we can uh, move further for the analysis so i yes. think it means uh, uh, there is a huge gap between this uh, mathematical analysis and uh, their uh, Uh, this curve fitting issue on uh, in the corresponding to the real day field data which we look at yes yes always the gap between our theory theoretical research and practical perspective exists always there we are trying to minimize the gap and second point all these models are something like to give you some idea about which direction we have to take just i i just tell you a very simple example you define an impulse function del of t right okay what is del of t is definition as per that it has zero uh, zero duration infinite height that's what del of t yeah. right is such a pulse exist in the world can you have uh, such a voltage pulse <laughs> no. with zero duration no. infinite height not at all Pr- practically uh, not possible then we do then we do all the analysis with the impulse response frequency response and all right yeah these things yeah. are ideal abstraction how to understand the behavior but you don't know what is an impulse but you can approximate an impulse for a particular application so the zero duration is for any system it has kind of a resistance to change the inertial time if your pulse width is lesser than the inertial time that pulse is impulse for that system that's it so we develop the mathematics in in a such a way then we know how to take it to practical applications then we may have to do all these changes how to approximate impulse okay this impulse is this pulse behaves like an impulse for this this impulse behave like that so we can we have to make these approximations when we take it to the practical concern Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, sir, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so you talked about CRAM, uh, but in India, um, right now the market is just uh, busy with 5G rollout, and they are talking mm. about ORAM. If you can just put some light on that. Uh, so, sorry, just I am. Um, I couldn't get uh, you clearly. In so Indian market, 5G rollout sites. is in full swing. hello ha ah, yeah yeah please say the text ah you are not saying, able to your voice i am saying in indian market 5g rollout is in full swing and a lot is being talked about oran in 5g so if you can just put some light on that okay open ran ha ah, yes very interesting question thanks actually i didn't include that in the slide but uh, there has been some uh, uh, recent discussion going on like why every service provider has to install their own tower do the infrastructure okay keep a radio access network open and then all of you can invest and take it away but this is what i think uh, i remember navin mb from darwa that was this point like he was also telling about that there is no free lunch in the world actually that is a problem what happens when all of you are when you think about this optimization problems and so on we think of fairness to all the users that is what the game theory comes into picture now what everyone will think about it i don't worry about what is going to happen but i want to do the best what i can do because of this uh, kind of a controversial discussion and so on that oran has been kept on hold uh, at present as far as i know but there have been some uh, uh, quite interesting discussion going on the upper layer but these things doesn't come to this kind of an research for this kind of mostly things are in economical for Uh, even either i or i don't know like our researchers they we don't get access to those information and all for example what is operating cost if at all you have to install one tower and if i think about okay we jointly do something who is going to access what how much time we are going to get access to that so this kind of or and framework is something under discussion but uh, that is a very, very interesting topic but as far as i know uh, the researchers uh, we don't get that much information about that cloud ran is a technique but the open ran like that involves more from the economist and uh, that involves more the commercial perspective to apart from research so i couldn't explore much on that but uh, i know that that is one of the, one of the interesting uh, line which would help to minimize the operational cost in future definitely at, at least for 5g when we have to have this kind of very high complex complicated or computationally complex processors 
it will be very good to employ the open rand framework and then do all the processing yeah thanks for finding out this Thank you, sir. sir, one uh, last question is uh, regarding that MIMO channel, which just uh, showing on your slide means, uh, uh, is, is it always advisable to have uh, the same number of antenna array on uh, uh, nomad on receiver as well as the transmitter, or means, for example, if we case, consider the case which we have discussed uh, by uh, sir, uh, sir, in which he is uh, mentioning the cooperative relay based communication. So, what happened if? Uh, Means, uh, is, is there and an, uh, means uh, conditions to be assumed that all uh, the nodes which is getting involved in the MIMO system should have the same number of antenna array? No, no, not necessarily. But so these things are like when you develop the system model, you have to incorporate that change. Oh. But as far as the mathematical framework and the technique is concerned, it is not necessary to have such a thing. But that will, that will give you more additional overhead, which you have to think about while doing the processing. See, again, another this cooperative communication, these things are like, again, uh, might work in a very indoor, but outdoor, it's quite difficult. Suppose uh, two users are involved in cooperative communication. So your mobile has to work for transmitting the data to another mobile. So uh, these kind of things in a cellular context is something uh, like whether everyone will afford to do that or not. So these things are like uh, on the paper, but still it will take some time to coming to the market with all the commercial perspectives. See, uh, what we actually think of because uh, uh, it means uh, multiple antenna install on uh, uh, transmitting and receiving and it's like a uh, in, means uh, increase the size of the hardware as well as overburden the signal processing task also. But if in case of uh, cooperation, cooperative communication, this overhead and uh, the hardware requirement could be reduced drastically. That's why I yes. ask you that. Yes, yes, uh, you are correct, of course, right. That is what envisioned first and then they have started to think about the cooperative and the cognitive communications and even in this beam also, there is something like, like a cooperative NOMA beam, like in the beam, whomsoever getting the faster, uh, very closest to the tower, he will just behave like relate to the back end users. Yeah, th these things are like will reduce the complexity for others. But again, uh, if you think of uh, why should I mobile waste my energy and power to transmit your data? So, so every processor and modern designer should have to be agree with that. Yeah, okay, yeah. Someone else is asking. Yes, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. sir. Actually, my doubt is on the topic of beamforming. Actually, in analog beamforming, actually, as you said, there is only a single RF model, RF chain. Uh, yeah. But if suppose I have a multi, uh, multiple data, that is parallel multi-user communication. Uh, uh -huh. In that case, uh, say for an example, I have around uh, 10 uh, users to be served at a time. Uh, just by using uh, around 200, more than 256 antennas, uh, as in the case of Massey MIMO, how many beams would, could, could be generated, sir? Is there any relation between the number of beams generated um, by the uh, Massey array, uh, or uh, how can we control it, actually? Is there any relation between the number of beams generated yes. by the array yes. and the number of users? If suppose I want to uh, make the control over it, as it Yes, yes. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Uh, I will explain it just. First, you have to uh, if they have a proper figure in this. Okay, now uh, one kind of thumb rule you, you have to understand. What is the purpose of antenna? What is the RF chain? What is the beam? Okay, now let me connect it with the simple case what I have here. Let me assume that I think any one of your mic is creating noise. Can you please mute? I don't know whose mic is that. 
Okay, just uh, let me explain with respect to this figure what the question you have asked. Uh, something you have to know as data stream, meaning that one data stream, one stream of symbols need one dedicated RF chain for that. Point number one. So suppose that I have only two RF chains, remove the doubt. Okay, I have two RF chains. I have uh, say 16 antennas here for the examples. Now I have these two users here, right? Now one, one RF chain can take control over one data stream only. Let, let me go from the beginning, then I will add on top of that all your questions. So instead of this thing, imagine only this first two dots. This data stream is connected to this RF chain. It is going through this to all the antennas. This is coming through this and RF chain to all the antennas. Now, beam is, it, it doesn't mean that one set of antennas can create only one beam. Virtually, that can create any number of beams, right? Since you have only one RF chain, number of RF chains will be generally equal to the number of beams it is creating. Point number two. So now your data will come here. All these phase shifters will jointly work for this. See, all these RF chains are connected to all the phase shifters. So this is also get connected to that. This is also get connected to that and they are summed up. Okay. Now stream one going through here, going through all the phase shifters. So the time delay or phase shift is adjusted. It is coming to all the antennas. Second user's data coming here. Second stream of data. Let me delay. Let us leave the user first. Second stream of data coming over here. It is again going through all the phase shifters for its own and coming to the antenna. Now in antenna one, there will be two entries. One corresponding to this data stream with the corresponding symbol plus another data stream with the corresponding phase, another symbol. That is what this will transmit. And so for all the 64 antennas will do the same job that will virtually create one beam directly focusing towards the user one because this user one is a corresponding receiver for the data stream. So that beam will focus to him. This data stream will be focusing to the user two. Now, you want more users to add. Only two ways of doing that. In the same beam, do the superposition coding or NOMA part so that in the beam you can serve two users. But in the same data stream has to be coded with the two. The symbol will be carrying two symbol power level like P1 S1 plus P2 S2. That is what will be coming here. Then. Like, but ideally one RF chain can take only one data stream, one one symbol. For example, S1 coming here and S2 coming here. S1 will be received here. If at all you want to accommodate more user in the beam, make S1 as a combination of two user data P1 E1 plus P2 E2. Then you serve the SIC. That's another part. But essentially, keep a simple thing. Then you can think on top of that. One data stream requires one RF chain. That RF chain creates one beam and transmitting towards a direction. There are new, some other new techniques, something known as beam splitting, but those things are quite advanced. But for the question in the simplest form, this is how data stream, RF chain, beams are connected. Okay, now you ask me your question exactly. Is that fine with you now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Clear, sir. Thank you. Yeah. See, transmit power is fixed. There is uh, there is no relation between if you increase the number of users and what is the transmit power. Transmit power is always fixed. How you are going to accommodate more number of users is the problem. If uh, suppose suddenly five people are calling, suddenly ten people are calling, if you keep on increasing exponentially your transmitting power, that will create hazardous radiation effect. There is no straightforward connection between like uh, to serve this many number of users, this is how the power. That, those are all system parameters. Given the tower, not even watts, it's a, they are dB milliwatt. With the corresponding 46 dBm or so, so how many number of coverage it can cover. On top of that user capacity is something different. So for the given power, we talk about what is the coverage area. Then within the coverage area, all do processing are in the baseband and the passband communication.
still any other part? Okay. Yeah. Okay, my next screen is visible. Sir, there is a question from Binu. Ah, okay. In one of the slides, I found that transmitter has set up DAC and RF chain. However, in the receiver section, DAC and RF chain. No, the slides I found the transmitter has set up DAC and RF chain. So, oh, if that is the case, that might be a mistake. That should be ADC. But even in receiver, has, see, both of them has both. When you are transmitting, you are going for DAC. When you are receiving, you are going for ADC. But again, mobile also has to receive. There is no fixer transmitter, fixer receiver. While transmitting, while receiving. That is how we have to interpret. If I put the title receiver and put the DAC, that is not correct. That has to be the ADC. Yeah, of course, definitely. So very good question. So when you do the analog beam forming, we don't have infinite precision phase shifters. For example, if you dedicate three bits, then you can have different eight amounts of phase shift or the 360 degree. So more number of you have, then you can make your beam narrower. If you make very, say, one bit ADC, then your beam will be like a, you come covering the entire region in the board. More and more number of resolution make your beam very narrower and uh, thinner and directivity more. Yes, the number of bit resolution impacts very well in the beam form. That directly reflects in the resolution and the beam width. Okay, so then I continue to the next part what I would like to discuss in the other slide. So, so far we have seen this kind of spatial modulation, right? So, what I have shown you earlier is like the uh, transmit side spatial modulation. So, what we are doing, this is what the picture we have seen. And uh, in the case of SM, just only one hour of chain means that is uh, spatial modulation. So I pick up any one of the antennas to transmit. So, and one thing here, what is the uh, uh, point we have to address here is that the scheme looks very good and that looks pretty much fine. So I have four antenna, I will activate only one. I will put the symbol there. So receiver has to identify what is transmitted and of course, uh, uh, which antenna is active and what is transmitted by the antenna, right? So if at all receiver has to find out which antenna is transmitted, then the receiver must know the channel state information, right? But typically what happens, like uh, one of the speakers have explained, like the uplink pilots are go because they do all the computation at the uh, base station. So always tower can do the all the computational and they can measure the CSI. Suppose if it is like a Ranjan pointed out very fast fading channels, then you cannot do the CSI estimation every now and then. Okay, even if you afford to do the CSA estimation every now and then, that is fine. But what happens? If at all receiver has to find out which antenna is transmitting, every time when the channel changes, it has to send the pilots to the tower, base station, or E node B. E node B has to do the CSA estimation. Again, that has to give the CSA information to the uh, mobile receiver and the control signal again to do the processing. Unless Receiver does not know the full channel state information. A receiver cannot find out which antenna is transmitting. It can receive the signal, but it cannot say from which antenna it is coming from. So the one difficult part of the spatial modulation or transmit side spatial modulation is that whenever you have uh, uh, receiving the signal, you, in order to identify which antenna is transmitting, you must know the CSA at the receiver. So every time the coherence time is over, send the pilot, to the computation of the tower, again send the back in the control signal about the CSA information to the mobile. So this sequence of events have to has to happen every time when the channel changes. That is one part of the difficulty. So essentially back take message is that transmit side spatial modulation requires CSA information at the receiver. Generally having CSA information at the receiver is, a, I mean, you can assume that in our paper, but in practice, with the very fast fading channels, it is a bit difficult. Okay, that is how we have something known as receive spatial modulation. I just skipped this math. I said I have prepared these things in the assumption that 
uh, all of you will be in this area but just i want to show you only minimum information to you others who are working you can learn from that other part is something like which is known as receiver spatial modulation okay i tell you what is the beauty of this now the same figure i have not changed it now i have the four antenna but this time all the four antennas will transmit okay and what will additionally happen is that instead of transmitting with one of the antenna and the receiver you create a virtual beam and in the even in the receiver not only to the receiver inside the receiver you you are making the beam in such a way that only a particular antenna on the receiver is activated say receiver has one to four antennas okay now you are creating a beam in such a way that very focused beam in such a way that your particular antenna on the receiver is activated all other antenna will not receive the signal see how uh, very focused and minute thing is that okay how to do that when you have this kind of very accurate beam forming you have to go for the digital beam forming mode then i will tell you how to do that a very simple math without worrying you too much say the, suppose you have np transmit antennas and you have nr receive antennas right now x is what your transmitter signal x this is what you have to transmit now say this is what your x now this is what you are going to transmit right so depending on the other two so first two information tells me that you have to transmit 1 plus j yeah i have decided 1 plus j i am going to transmit second two bits now these two bits determine based on this receiving antenna so if a receiver has four antenna you can decode four information bits not the transmit antennas since the receiver has four antennas next two bits tell me out of the four which one i am going to activate it tells me that activate the fourth one okay now i put the symbol at the fourth place now you have all zeros followed by one plus j right next i am multiplying this x vector by a matrix which is nothing but a pre coder matrix whenever you say pre coder that is nothing but a digital beam forming meaning that you need those many number of rf chains that is equal to the number of antennas that is one of the drawback in the receive spatial modulation okay i go to the for more detail what is the pre coder matrix how to design that just don't worry about the scaling factors and all that is to make the power normalization other than that it is nothing p is equal to h hermitian and h h hermitian inverse that is what the p matrix just what will happen when you plug in p here now this is then not the transmitter since transmitters know the csi it can multiply the x matrix with this one okay that is what will be transmitted what receiver will get entire px will be multiplied by h that is what will be received so if you multiply by h what will happen h h hermitian the same inverse so you will get identity matrix then y will be equal to without noise y will be equal to just x plus noise what is x this four zero 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 one plus j so automatically that is equivalent to everything is equal to activating the fourth antenna so all the four receiving data streams will tell 0 0 0 only this one will be set only 1 plus j without i'm in the absence of noise i'm saying so by how what you have to do in the receiver do you need csi at the receiver now no all that you need just a amplitude detector at the four part which amplitude detector goes more signal just you get the data from the decode that index that data will tell you the information quite so receiver part is very simple as simple as it is but only drawback is that the transmitter we may have to employ digital decoder which requires number of rf chain equal to number of antennas right so this is what we call it as receive spatial modulation so that is why the rate meaning that number of bits you can communicate in single shot is that log 2m if you are using the mri signal constellation it is log 2m and log 2nr not nt earlier we were using log 2nt because depending on the information bits you are choosing one transmit antenna index now here you are choosing one receive antenna index comparatively the bpc your rate will be lesser compared to tsr because in receiver we are not going to have more that many number of massive number of antennas so compared to transmitter receiver may have at max 16 or 64 antennas not beyond that so that is what the limitation in the bpc you however The receiver job is quite easier so this is one another uh, technique uh, receive spatial modulation compared to tsm this is also uh, used in some of the places where you don't want to do the much complications in that there might be another technique like joint transmitter and receiver modulation there 
instead of having the antennas entirely, just you group them like one group, second group, third group, fourth group. Okay. Now what you can do is that based on the information bits, okay, you anyway you have to do the digital beamforming. In the receiver side also, you can make the, those many number of groups. But if you want to do that, you may need at least 32 to 64 antennas. So make some transmit groups, make some receiver groups. You decide based on the information bit which antenna group has to communicate which group. So that also carries additional information. So what will happen when you create the beam towards that? Out of these four groups, which group is going to do the job? That is, that carries on information. By doing that, which antenna is going to be activated? That is doing another information. So this is like a joint transmitter and receiver spatial modulation. And I have given some math details here. Yeah, that is what here you can see, like how many beams you can create and how these beams are communicated. So receiver has to identify from which direction it is coming from and automatically it will be activating one receiving antenna which gives the maximum information for that. So here, for example, one communicating with three, four communicating with two. So like that, this all this mapping carries the information. So that is how you can increase the data rate. Mapping in the sense that you have four groups in the transmitter, four groups of the receiver. So there is four factorial ways of mapping that, right? So log two of that can convey some more information. So what receiver has to do? Not only it will be activated, it has to find the direction of the beam. Yeah, I think I leave this part to you and let me check if there are any other information which I can convey. This is what I said in the fully connected architecture, all the RF chains are connected to all these antennas. And hybrid, it is only very group of antennas are connected to every RF chain. I hope these things will be too heavy for the other audience. Let me just stop it and I will be sharing these slides too. I just tell one thing, those who are um, working in this area, who can understand the slides, if you have any questions, you can meet, uh, just discuss with me after this FDP is over. You can drop me an email, we can discuss. If you are working in this area, if you want to follow what is uh, going on in this area. Now let me do just something I want to discuss. Okay, now you'll be able to see my next screen. Uh, this, so let us just, I would like to discuss, uh, I would like to discuss few things about, with respect to our country, I think that is what uh, many of you were discussing. I, I have prepared for this too. Like in, in our country, what are the challenges we are facing to deploy 5G or roll out 5G then? Now, what I have done, uh, this left part is like a 4G network coverage in India. See, all these white spaces are not covered. That is how. Just if you look at, uh, almost you can say 20% is not covered with 5G network. Only all these white spaces are here and there. So that is based on the source speed test.net. So why that is that? That is measuring the signal at different places and the correspond, even though they tell you it is a 4G network. What is the actual end user speed you are, you are facing? That is not according to the requirement or designated for the 4G. So this is what the actual scenario This I have taken a month before. I don't think that it has been changed very drastically after that. And this right side, this is just exactly where I am sitting. Uh, if you go to the source open signal, that will show you the signal strength indicators around you. Just you go to the website, that will tell you how to work on it. So right now our IIT Goa campus is in Ponda here. So this is a map, signal coverage map in the city where I am sitting now. All these uh, green parts are fully covered and red parts are partially uh, entirely covered. From green to red, you have to orange or you have to think about. Green is the top coverage, red is the very least coverage. Right, so good coverage, bad coverage, as the figure mentioned. Seen here, even in the place where I am sitting, even there are no coverages at all and very bad coverage and those places are like uh, very moderate and there is no signal at all. So what I am, we can experience is that only in the city, the, within the uh, city limit, uh, the network speed, everything might be very good. But what exactly happens in our rural area? That is the bottleneck to employ 5G. Because already you have uh, uh, not given the fullest benefit of 4G to all the rural people, rural sector. And there are even some places in our country where we have seen that they have just got their cellular connection recently. And that is because of the location and 
uh, their own background development. So every infrastructure has to be developed from the beginning for them to give all these things. Already we are lagging in that. So just thinking about 5G, just to be compromising all these things is something quite challenging. And this is the number of patents filed by different companies or uh, agencies or whatever in terms of 5G, meaning that who is holding more stake in the 5G? Like Huawei is the very first, Nokia, LG, Ericsson, Samsung, Qualcomm, then ZT. So this gives the order. Okay, so now in, in uh, this is more on the European Telecommunication Standard Institute that has already been released the data about how many number of pat patents hold by which company and that. And this is the uh, radio access network vendor by 2023. What is the projection? How many, which of these companies may have uh, can have by 2023, what will be the share in the REM and that is what I think uh, someone, uh, uh, I think Amrita pointed out, the open track. Th this is the reason they were trying to say something about why you want to sectorize all these things, I mean, uh, take the stake in the different uh, uh, shares, all of us take the entire thing and invest on that. So that is what proposed based on this. Since all of them, many others have tried to come almost uh, uh, half of the stake came to from Ericsson and Huawei. So that then they have thought about the open RAM and all, but uh, I, I didn't know after that what kind of uh, discussion at the higher levels are happening. And so this was taken from the strategy analytics in 2019. At the time they have predicted what will be in 2023. Now let, let me slowly discuss what happens in other case. Right. Okay. Now we, if you think about the challenges in connecting rural India, first part is that low average revenue per user. See that ARP measures that how much revenue you can get back when one user adds to your network. Early you might have remembered that uh, uh, you may get a call like if you buy the SIM card, one data free like that. They are they're trying to advertise people to get more SIM card network, but now no one is doing that. They have reached the saturation. Once they have done they, beyond this point, ARP won't increase, they won't advertise to the users to come. Even if you get and uh, we are keep on doing the port from one network to another network, keep on doing that, but that hardly affects the system because we are almost saturation level. Once if you leave from one service provider, immediately one will add to the same service provider. But now we are at this stage, but think about what we have come across before attaining at this point. It has been a long way, right? Starting from paying one GB, we have paid a lot of amount for one month all the way from there. We have reached up to this point. But the same kind of scenario, again, we may have to go across to reach the part where 5G is something like a handy tool. Until then, the ARP will not be that much. So no one will be ready to afford it at, uh, at the rate what we are facing. So the initial market or initial rate of either 5G market or 5G, suppose not yet commercialized, if at all one has uh, brought into the system that, okay, yeah, now I have fully deployed 5G in the city, then definitely the network cost and everything will be very high at the beginning. That too in the city areas. But if you think of rural areas, that there is no backbone infrastructure at all. I will show another figure. But giving their 5G is really difficult. So that these are all some bottlenecks where stops are compared to the other countries where they have already rolled out 5G in their country, but why we are not able to. And second major problem, fiber backhaul. I, I will show you that figure also in the uh, next one. The fiber, I think one of the speaker also pointed out that. When you make a call, from your mobile phone to the nearest tower is wireless, that's all. After that, everything is done in the backhaul network. So from tower to tower is connected via the backhaul and all the base station controllers, what we have VAC. And after that, entirely it is a fiber backbone. Now then the fiber is going all through the wave oceans and connected to the other countries. So it is not that we make a wireless call from here to US simply over the air. No, everything is with the fiber backbone. But if you want to increase uh, increase that much a drastic speed in the cellular or some other uh, devices or terminal, let us call that as a terminal for better understanding, then the fiber backbone will not support to that extent. So you may have to completely either increase the capacity of the fiber what we are having or you may have to add more places in the fiber connection. See, for example, if you think of millimeter wave, for example, then what will happen? You may have to increase the number of towers. So that will have both state and central uh, uh, regulatory body issue. Suddenly, if someone comes and uh, trying to say, no, no, I am going to employ uh, 3,000 towers in the Chennai city area. From Madayar to Tamram, I am going to deploy 3,000 towers. Who will accept it? 
So this is a problem. So then millimeter wave cannot you cannot you have to rule it out from the city center. So okay, even though you got the permission or all the regulatory bodies coincidentally uh, were together, then you have to make the complete fiber backhaul for all the three thousand towers which you can want to employ uh, deploy in the city. Just for a city, if you have to go to this much, think about the rural areas where we don't have any back uh, backbone infrastructure at all. And another problem: intermittent availability of electricity. Yes, our country is not electricity surplus country. Now, so in a nutshell, what are all the major points? Huge investment required. Any service provider who is coming to say, "Okay, I am ready to give," first he has to invest a lot to take it back, and then to get the decent ARP back, things have to be big. <laughs> Expensive spectrum. Yeah, all this millimeter wave band and all the feasible bands in the higher region. what we think we can communicate there are two things like uh, both the spectrum is expensive uh, to get that second part you may have to think about like many of you are keep on pointing out from the beginning you may have to completely revamp all the hardware existing if at all you want to go to that extent immediately 3g to 4g is an incremental uh, improvement but 4g to 5g is a complete revamp so that is not something like okay so do some modifications you will get fights you have to slowly migrate from 4g to 5g all the way down so it's a long way to go and again lack of uniform policy framework for tower installation ofc infrastructure it has different policy framework within this even this panchayat city uh, and then state so everyone has different framework different regulatory bodies and as i said local regulatory issues if at all you have to have uh, 30 towers per kilometer then to cover the delhi city alone you must have 36000 cells If at all you want to employ these spectrums, right? Then uh, debit scenario in the industry. Yes, as I said, how much approximately this I have taken from internet source. How much crore you may have to need from the telecom service provider to launch it first. And the next, what is the lag we are having? Completely, we have in the metro cities alone. I am saying, not over the country. In the metro cities alone, we need twenty-eight thousand kilometer length of optical fiber cable. But right now, on an average, they are covered and with. Uh, backbone support with only 6000 kilometers and security of course when everything is out in the internet including your say if someone is good at uh, we think whatever we are browsing in the in our uh, thing it is not uh, going out just imagine you just open the browser such something in amazon next time when you browse in some other computer advertisement will come below to you that much our privacy is out So, but even you have all the devices like your health care, TV, everything is on the internet. Then what will happen? Everybody can simply hack and come to know that how what is your blood pressure, what is your sugar level. Everything will be open. Not only that, so that is the problem. Like in internet of things, IoT and when everything is out in the internet, privacy, security is a big challenge. We have to be careful ourselves, but we cannot make sure that uh, and our our data and everything is safe and authenticated. And the digital divide. Already we are facing this problem. Already rural areas are disconnected from the development. Of course, now we can see in the vaccine when people lay in the. Of course, those who are all sitting here, you probably you are having a very good internet connection. You can book your slot. But there are still people who have to wait or go for some other place uh, for getting the slot. And then there have to be something like a open walk. Then only they can go and take it. And even just before that, think about your IAS. We just get booking for that occur. Right, so those who have the internet, just you can sit in your home, open that. It will be open, open for let's say eight to ten or ten to twelve. I don't remember exactly. Nowadays I am not frequently booking in the train, but uh, from ten to nine, when I was there in Chennai, when I have to go home, okay, immediately waking up at uh, Thursday morning early and be ready at eight o'clock or something. Okay, in the sitting place you can do that. You can book it. But those who are waiting to do the same thing, those who don't have internet, those who don't know how to use the internet. they will be waiting in the queue before that ticket counter opens they will be there from 6 o'clock or 5 o'clock they will be sitting in the long queue to book the same ticket right after that only government changed that their booking slot in the ticket counter will be open from 8 to 10 or some time or 10 to 12 i don't know after 2 hours only it will be open in the internet that is because of the digital divide problem all of us are not in the same we are not getting the same thing uniformly among us that is one and widely used to debate human exposure to ultra high frequency still the some research and the analysis the debate is going on how much that will be hazardous if we are exposed to that much high frequency since it is not done before uh, all the things are under the debate and it has to be properly analyzed nevertheless 
before uh, allowing anything, government will ensure that that is not hazardous to the human. Okay. Now, I, this IMT is our own standard for the India. So, what is that? What they are proposing? Like, for example, the 5G, this policy IMT 2020 targets that even though if you are traveling in a bullet train at 120 km per hour speed, okay, you will get a very good data speed, like Wi Fi on train, Wi Fi on board, like that. But we are not worried about that. I'm not thinking about the person who is traveling in the 120 km per hour bullet train. I am thinking about the local people who are, who are not even getting the basic internet facility. So that is why what we have is something like frugal 5G. Connect the disconnected people. So what we are trying to do is that low mobility but large cell coverage. I'm not concerned about who is always running over the train. If he's going over the train, he can browse later. That's it. We are trying to have something like mobile broadband connection in the rural, rural EMB, EMBB. So, the, so the, whatever standard defines in the European and US countries, we are not able to directly take it because our focus is something different and the policy framework is something different, which is meant in the broad, abroad countries. Now, what we have found, our researchers have found that now we have the television communication, right? TV is operating at ultra high frequency. Earlier, what happened? We have so many channels, uh, so every channel was occupying a particular band and then they were doing. Now with the this TV and satellite, they have started to multiplex several things. With a single card, you are getting all the channels multiplexed. You can choose the channel among the, with the this TV. So that released a lot of um, spectrum spaces in the ultra high frequency, which were earlier meant for TV. So there is a proposal to use this TV ultra high frequency wide spaces by use of something known as fiber point of presence to the village. Suppose there is a village path, I will show you here. Say, this is what the fiber point of presence, this is connected with the cloud backbone network to this place, right? Say, for example, up, uh, 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 away from this, there is no connection to the uh, remote place. There, it is proposed that just only deploy the middle mile client, that is technically, that is in the earliest name, so those towers will be operating from this one to this one will be operating at the UHF ultra this TV white spaces. And these towers or middle mile client towers will be acting like an extended Wi-Fi hotspot for these regions, wherever there is no coverage. So if, if this backbone network is fully uh, frugal 5G, what they have generally referred to, if they are able to employ it in a fully functional, then 5G can be brought to the rural areas too. Right. So, like, and some of the technical challenges, what you have, we have been discussing a uh, long stretch, like uh, we need advanced fabrication facility. And, uh, and of course, when we think about our uh, part, many of the process are not developed from our country. So that is one of the big challenges. We have to uh, import all the processes from outside. Even though we have make in India mobile phones, those processes are not, sometimes all the components we may have to import from uh, abroad. That is why, now it is promoted that make everything in our country, make our own, like either it is a processor or hardware platform, let us make it ourselves to reduce the cost. So now they have, this, uh, they have given some statistics about how much optical fiber, how much amount required taken from this source. Just it's for information. You can look at it later also. Okay, I think uh, that's it from my side. I open to a few more discussion and then I will discuss other points. So we have a question from so Dilu. Yeah, okay. Ah, yes, sir, please. Yeah, go ahead. Sir, uh, in 5G, uh, you told we will have uh, Pico towers, uh, control towers like that, uh, and we will have a base station at the center. Uh, how we can implement uh, this uh, sensing? That is, uh, we will have complicated instruments, etc. Whether it is applicable in this domain, the 5G domain. Or, uh, yeah, I, I got Is it costly? Ah, okay, so thank you. Yeah. So you are talking about the uh, spectrum sensing in cognitive radio. Okay. That, that is in the unlicensed band. So there are two things. One licensed spectrum, another thing is unlicensed spectrum. 
So there is something known as ISM band, which is unlike SEST. That is left for the research perspective itself, like industry, medical and science platforms. Right. So that band is free. When in that band, you can make in such a way that to one primary user or one secondary user, where you can make wherever there are the free spectrum, you can go and obtain that. But that cognitive radio is not something for the 5G or advanced network. That is not in the policy. So only okay. device to device, uh, we can have yes, yes. 5G. Yeah, yeah. Well, what we have seen yesterday in the narrowband IoT, and then in those applications, we can think about the cognitive spectrum instead of going for the uh, spectrum allocation. And now you can think about cognitive radio primary instances. There you have to sense a larger bandwidth. So we have to sense the spectrum and we just imagine that that kind of thing cannot happen in the other context is very difficult. So you have to keep on scanning that. Once it is free, you will be occupying. Again, you have to scan other band and as it's that band, whether primary user is coming in or not. Once it comes yeah. in, so this kind of uh, uh, very uh, tedious business cannot happen in the kind of that much high ultra speed communication where everything has to be done in millisecond. Uh, not even in microsecond. And again, uh, since the coverage is also within uh, some 10 meters, because of 5G, we cannot uh, have this kind of sensing. Yeah, so basically that cognitive radio sensing part is something for the uh, like D2D or uh, specialized localized applications. And uh, within, uh, 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 for example, uh, other networks. So that is where it is primarily meant for. Okay. That framework is not directly taken or extended to this uh, cellular structure or 5G pattern. Thank you. Sir, can you suggest any research in the uh, What are the research topics we can? Sorry. What What are the research topics uh, we can do in the IG? In physical layer. Uh, in physical layer. Physical layer. Yeah. Okay. I will just share some list of topics to maybe to your email. Yeah. Yeah. I was just trying to read one question from Binu and. Understand the trailers, okay? Many small cells is less visible and densely populated, okay? Can this go on? Yes, actually, that is what this picture was all about. Yeah. But I did not discuss that since uh, uh, it goes more into the depth. This is what the one where to use the existing power line communication, power grid for the optical fiber network backup. So now the problem is to employ your fiber, right? But why don't you use existing power line grid? It is already, at least if you have electricity, you must have this backbone. So now the point is like, where can we? That is what exactly you are asking. Can we use the fiber net, uh, network with this kind of backbone with electricity? But these are all the challenges will be there. It can be done, but it has its own challenges. Even here also, some of our uh, colleagues are working on this part, but it has its own challenges in that. Oh, yes. Uh, okay. I think I have answered to this question. And uh, someone, yeah, Ashwin, you can unmute and speak. You are enabled. Yes, sir. So, very general question. What do you think? What is the lifespan of 5G technology? Lifespan in the sense after 5G is rolled out, how long it will be? Sir, please say it again. No, no, I'm not getting your question. Lifespan means to get to 5G or to use 5G? Uh, uh, I mean to say because first 2G communication was there, then 3G came, 4G came, no uh, 5G. So what do you think when the 6G technology will come? How many years this 5G technology will stay? Do you have some idea, sir? Or yeah, is it... Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So already research has been started in 6G as well with the terahertz communications. 
but that is mostly mm. on main on the side of medical biomedical perspective so this medical electronics those instrument you might have seen the ur llc part of the use case that is where hologram augmented reality virtual reality that is how they are trying mm. to use with the terahertz band but uh, the 5g cellular at least it has to be here for a minimum of, we will be in the era for 10 years from it has been rolled out assuming that we have more active research it has been going on that we can see other advancement after 5g to come into the market i, I don't foresee lesser than 10 years sir uh, am i audible sir ah okay hello I... am i audible sir yes who is speaking yeah this is anand here anand ranjan ah okay yes yes uh sir uh, uh, last uh, i think two year back when uh, two or uh, three year back when 5g was supposed to be launched in uk then a lot of the microwave equipment get uh, you know disturb in its operation so it means uh, there is some uh, health hazardous or uh, some uh, machinery hazardous phenomena will be there if the 5g technologies comes in full flesh in our india is it yeah, a possibility that is not as i have mentioned one of the challenges for the regulatory because see, uh, what uh, uh, what uh, the t- uh, 2 gigahertz band and uh, microwave is operating at 2.4 gigahertz of uh, microwave is 2, 2 gigahertz and uh, this uh, 2.4 gigahertz of band there, there is there is a very small uh, gap between these two frequencies so uh, how could we actually prevent uh, ourselves as well as our uh, equipments which are operating with the microwaves yeah that is what i have mentioned in one of the uh, bottlenecks before ensuring that regulatory bodies cannot allow them to operate in that band uh, so i think that is what the uh, job of them they will check and verify and after ensuring that uh, okay if i release that won't create any hazards to either to the equipments or human exposure then only it will be in the market i mean those kind of band with what you are referring to. so it means uh, uh, the communication frequency will be not uh, near to 2 or uh, 2.4 gigahertz no near 2.4 you have you are even wifi even up to 5 we have right yeah your wifi is operating at 2.4 and That's microwave like. is operating at 2 uh, uh, yeah. gigahertz and yeah. we have another wifi band uh, if you see it wifi w n i don't know the generation name some of you can help so that is operating at 5 gigahertz so now we can go up to 5 but in the low range within a uh, home or building that's it but now the so human organ human organs will be safe uh, in uh, 5g and above 5g environment you say no, no no what i am saying up to 5 we know what is the frequency level how much power i have to ensure to avoid the radiation hazards that is what often you uh, refer to like uh, you might have come across sub 6 gigahertz and above that Sub six, you know, below six, we have everything clear. But what is no. we are having above that? Like if we go to 24 GHz spectrum, no one knows. Suppose I keep on sitting here with the 24 GHz radiation, I don't know what will happen to me. So we have okay. tested properly, and then yeah, there is no experimental results for that. It is hypothesized that it won't create any hazards with properly maintained power level, but still that has to be verified. Because and is, is it true thing? that uh, we have lost some species of uh, you know birds uh, uh, with this uh, kind of radiations? Yeah. So yeah. Is it true or? Uh... Uh, to be honest, I don't know really because I have also seen the movie in Tamil. He called. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that has been in Hindi also. I don't know the name uh, in Hindi version, but uh, Robo in the Tamil movie. Yeah. yeah, I have also seen that. that was uh, well, what's your opinion but you really in this field and you might have some uh, no, no. Uh, means even after that uh, my colleagues also started to kid me why are you trying to kill all the bird and do the 5g is a stop that and go some do something else so yeah uh, really i don't know that uh, whether that is validated or taken from the reliable source i don't know but the movie i enjoy it since my favorite act so i also enjoy it <laughs> 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 thank you Uh, sir, I have a question similar yeah. to Anand. 
uh, actually i was going through a research paper uh, which was talking about hazards of 5g on the human okay. uh, body and uh -huh. it said that the signals are divided into ionizing and non ionizing signals okay so ionizing signals generally tend to change the dna of the body but the non ionizing uh, signals just increase the body temperature so, so 5g uh, is going to increase the body temperature by 1 degree that's what that research paper said oh, but I who see. approves but who approves how much temperature of a body could be increased and how how is that judged like they said yes it is going to bring some changes to the human body it's going okay. to increase the body temperature by 1 degree but what if it's 2 degrees or 5 degrees how, who decides how much body temperature is okay to increase ah okay even if at all that says that i don't know so uh, which journal or publication i see i have not uh, come across that uh, so I'm, I'm not i'm not sure about this uh, paper okay. right now because uh, the um, actually it was lot in news due to um, um, high court proceeding going on of oh. juhi chavla with the high court regarding the 5g implementation in india so uh, during that time i came across few papers online which were talking about oh. hazards of 5g oh okay so okay if you can uh, uh, get access to the paper or if you can pull it out share it with me i am also interested to see that what is what exactly has been from that but definitely if they are saying uh, how much temperature definitely that will not be allowed like in the sense even uh, our normal temperature to fever is just about 2 degrees higher right 98 is normal 100 is fever right right so uh, so 1 degree is not something like acceptable that's I'm, why uh, i was so concerned I, ki how they decided that 1 degree is fine yeah yeah <laughs> yeah we have to uh, after that only it will be allowed definitely yeah right Uh, yes, uh, Sanjay, please. Hi, yes, Sanjay, you can unmute and speak. Hello. Hi, uh, yes, please, yeah. Yeah, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes, please. Ah, sir, actually, if we are doing uh, research in uh, handover in 5G. Hello. Ah, yeah, yeah, I, I'm listening to you. Yes. So, yes, uh, uh, so to which layer it will be uh, related then? Uh, to uh, what, what is the final question? Uh, if we are doing a, a handover in 5G, so to which layer it will be related then? Physical layer and mac layer. Part of physical and mac layer. Physical part in the mac layer. And that's a resource okay. allocation problem. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. And Thank you, sir. yes. Okay. Yeah. I think one of the questions from the participants: How hazardous? Yeah. That's what we have been discussing. How, why? Why do we often need to change the phone battery? HD is implemented. Yeah. That is true. That is what I said. When you buy a 5G phone, no, no, nothing will work. You have to change it. Nobody will accept. Of course, when generation changes, you have to change the phone. If at all, you won't experience that. But again, 5G is not only meant for cellular phone. Just keep that. That, that can encompass several things together. Fifth generation wireless network, not fifth generation cellular networks. A research opportunities in the machine learning in 6G. Yeah, as we said, in the machine learning, like even I have also... Uh, trying to look something in the problem statement but one thing is that except the um, very strong mathematical foundations what we are having already machine learning seems to be more uh, like like a buzzy word that's it that's what i experienced in the first place though you can say that you can apply machine learning to that with the underlying framework of ml estimate actually maximum likelihood estimate there if you have come across estimation theory problem if you see that and that asymptotically efficiency of ML, there is a property. When you have a large data record, how you can perform? This is an age-old topic, actually, with the finite data records and large data records, how much you can achieve. So that has been, uh, even with Winston Poor, which is where the book was written in 1975. At the time itself, it was well established. Like the SIC to NOMA case, what we have said, this kind of coming in a different flavors. 
second point in the machine learning only part is that the, all the framework which works with python or something other tools i have also uh, trying to learn the different tools there but if you check where will you go and get access to the data set so that is a problem but if you give a data set that will be trained and then it will do the job i am also doing something with the machine learning for something known as automatic modulation classification so there is an application with the so i have what i have understood from the is that like uh, except the core underlying math this kind of machine learning and some very funny applications are seem to have some uh, trouble i don't think they will take it up to that extent in the part of 5g i'm saying not to the machine learning applications in the 5g or 6g I'm saying, in communications of that area <clears throat> that can over emphasize to the beyond certain extent just a minute. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So next one is uh, opinion. Computer seems to have a research scope. Yes, definitely. And that is because uh, the low data rate sampling and with the lesser number of samples, uh, recovering higher dimension signal. Yeah. If you, I can also just if you can drop an email sometime, I will send very few papers related to compressor sensing applications in wireless communications. So definitely it has a scope. What tools are required to do research in 6G? Even it is not yet uh, clear like what uh, 6G will come. We don't have the tools, whatever we are existing, they cannot help you to do the research in 6G. So again, we need the tool to do the research. Uh, to answer Bino's question, I don't think so. Yeah, in fact, I am not that much exposed to answer this question. But I understand the logic behind your question. Yeah. So anyone else? Okay. Ah, straight. Ah, yeah, Sanjay. Ah, so I will uh, just drop. I will respond to that. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, please go ahead. Ah, uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Sir, uh, in uh, millimeter wave communication, you already insisted that point. Uh, Many small cells may be deployed. Mm. Right, sir. Uh, in yeah. that context, uh, what kind of uh, antenna will be mounted in uh, small cell? Either, either whether it is omnidirectional or, uh, or a sectorized antenna. And another Definitely sectorized. Oh, okay. Six, six, six sector, uh, sectorized or uh, three sectorized antenna will be suggested, sir. If, even with if we, apart from the fixed sectors and if you think of some kind of a smart antennas applications if you go and refer to the website um, uh, samir uh, that's in chennai the ph rao is a director if you check in this page and the post you will come to know what different antenna they have recently fabricated targeting the 5g applications uh, and uh, one more thing, can you suggest uh, any resource management uh, allocation among the, the small cells? What kind of uh, resource management will uh, go in that context? I have come across some papers, but since I am not talking in that Mac layer perspective, uh, right away I don't have anything on my mind. Just drop my email, but I have come across few things when I was working on some other problem. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So, uh, what, sir, one uh, question from Anand here. Ah, yes, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, ah, yes, uh, please. so, so far we have uh, see cellular architecture means uh, uh, deploying the small bit, uh, small power BTSs with some uh, in a hexagonal shape means RF planning is done on the basis of cellular model. So, the 5G will also be uh, done in the same way or is there any other criteria to, uh, you know, R for the RF planning? No, no. See, these kind of fixed uh, traditional methods, they cannot change because they won't experiment for the first time that way investing that much. So, so again, we have a khichdi kind yeah. of uh, installation on yeah, the yeah. sites. Means that those the sites will be crowded with the 2G BTS, 3G BTS, 4G yeah. BTS, yeah. and 5G yeah. BTS. You know. Yes, that is more oh, likely. Yeah. In, at okay. least in the beginning. <laughs> at least in the beginning. Oh. Yeah. 